morning, Steve. Morning. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> um, my name is Sam Spencer, and as you can see, I am a software developer. Um, I've been a software developer for quite some time, and I'd like to explain why I'm here talking to a group of librarians, because it's, it's kind of a strange position for me to be in. Um, I never really, I, I haven't studied library science. Um, I started in, in the government data management sector and I began going to a lot of conferences and there was a lot of overlap with the information sciences. And I started seeing these terms, data librarian, come up. And I started getting very, very curious about what that meant. And it seemed to me that there was a large overlap between how we as the development community, as, as professional programmers, were approaching data management and how libraries have been doing it for quite some time. Um, the more I looked into the theory of this, the more I looked into the background of this, I saw that there were no new principles in computer science when it came to information management. They've been approached before many, many times and reinvented. Um, so I wanted to talk to you today about what data is, what it means to me as a developer, somebody who implements systems that people use on a daily basis, and, and why we're all data librarians, each and every one of us. Everybody with an iTunes library is a data librarian. We're all managing something at some point, you know, every day of our lives nowadays. So this is a little washed out on the screen, but this is a book. Um, are you guys familiar? <coughs> okay, all the ones in the room. Good. Okay, um, we're, we're off to a good start. This is uh, the Australian Bureau of Statistics yearbook from 1998. This has been published every year for a hundred and something odd years. If you open this book, you will find uh, about two or three hundred pages of data tables that describe the demographics of Australia. Um, this is a really valuable book and has been valuable in understanding the Australian, uh, Australian demographics for quite some time. Um, but the fact that it's a book is irrelevant. Um, what people are really excited about is what's inside the book. Um, being able to find the book, being able to understand the book is what people are most interested in, not the media on which it was produced. This is the same thing. This is the ABS table builder. You go online, you can find the exact same tables, but no longer is it printed, no longer is it stored somewhere physical. This is now like an intangible object that you can find through an internet browser, and you can access the exact same information. So the first question I'd ask you guys is, has librarianship ever been about managing books? Or has it been about managing the access to the information they're in? I would say that they're both the same discipline. Like, the idea of somebody managing a database and the idea of somebody managing access to information through a storage mechanism that just happens to be paper, the overlap is, is immense. Um, what we're really interested in is data. And we have been for some time. And I love this slide purely because it shows apparently data is blue. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't alter that, I just searched for data. Um, so if, if that's the case, if we're really focused on information, like, what are we doing around this and how are we managing this information and, and how are we managing this information today? So that's what today's talk about is about. It's not about the media, um, but all about how we store that, how we access that and how we use that efficiently to provide services to individuals. Um, and again, I'd like to point out, like, what I'm describing is my job as a software developer, but I think that I'm also describing our jobs as, as librarians, as, as information access people. So, these are the things we're going to be talking about. Like, what, how do we manage data um, in a very, very quick way? Because this is a, a very long topic. Um, how do we store and find information? What standards exist for us to, to do that? Um, where is this data? And how, most importantly, how do you evaluate data in, in today's society? So, um, first of all, on the subject of, of managing data, this can really be brought down to two topics. Um, and these are two topics you'll have seen covered quite some time. Um, data storage and data retrieval. Um, being able to efficiently manage the storage of information and being able to efficiently retrieve it from a, a store of information, regardless whether it's a stack of books or a database or some kind of piece of software where you start throwing information in, um, the, both of these topics are the, are the most key fundamental aspects to any data management platform today. Um, with regards to data storage, it's a very, very broad topic. Um, when we're looking at how data is delivered to an agency, um, outside of the topic of books, uh, in a lot of contexts you need to deal with the data as it arrives. Um, you can't change it, it's not yours. It's not your book, you can't 
feel like, oh, it'd be so much easier if I could just chop some of these pages out of it. It's so much better. No, no. We, we can't do that. Likewise with information, with data as it's delivered to, a, to an archive, to, a, to an area where it's being stored, where it's being provisioned, um, being able to, to understand that the, the key aspects are how you store that and how you understand that are, are the most important parts there. Um, and, and again, these, these change. Um, whether it's a CSV, whether or not you're talking about access to databases, whether or not you're talking about access to Excel spreadsheets or scan PDFs. The, the ways that we provision this information do change on a daily basis. And within a 20 minute time slot, I, I can't cover everything. But the most important thing that I can say is that you need to back up your data. Um, when evaluating any data provision system, ask your providers. And then I say this as, as somebody who's telling you how to evaluate these kind of things now. Ask your providers, how are they backing their information up? Because that's a, a really key topic. Like, what are they doing to make sure this stays relevant? What are they doing to make sure that I, I continue to have copies of this? Um, unlike the physical object of a book, data backups online are, are so easy nowadays. I can make 100,000 million copies of a piece of information with no loss of granularity to the original. Um, so making sure that you have backups is important and making sure you back up often. When you're talking to a provider about a data provision uh, tool, how often are they backing it up? How much rollback do I have? Did, do I get a backup snapshot from yesterday? Like if I mess it up today, can I go back to yesterday? Is it a week? Is it a month? Is it whenever I click the button? Because if, I, if, it, if backups are only happening when I click the button, that's important to know. Um, backup, your backups. I'm sorry, I'm going to do this one. I've seen people get bitten by this a lot. Um, multi, one backup isn't sufficient. Multiple backups are necessary. Um, Keep your backups as far away from your original data as possible. Um, this one seems quite silly, but if you have a laptop and you keep a backup on like a USB drive right next to the laptop and your house burns down, this was useless. <laughs> I mean, you really shouldn't have done it. Um, keeping off-site storage um, and knowing how that's stored and managed from, from a provision perspective is the key importance around this. Knowing how, when you're, you're engaging data professionals to make sure that that information is stored elsewhere is, is fundamental. And lastly, um, who here has a backup of their home software? Right? Okay. When was the last time you checked that that backup was valid? Like last month? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Within the last year? Probably. Who here has a backup but hasn't checked it? <laughs> it's okay. Like this is why we're here, right? We're here to learn. Like it's not a backup. I'm just saying. Yeah. Go home and check it. No, no, no. Just go home and test it. Because especially with these things, every component of, of a backup system is verifying that you can back it up. Like that you can go back to that that point in time. Like if the point at which you determine whether or not it's valid is after a disaster has happened, that's too late. This should be an ongoing part of your daily management process around how you deal with this information. Um, so, yeah, with data, you kind of have to deal with it, where it comes from. Like, as it comes from a provider, as you start like managing this information, bringing it in, you, you deal with it as it arrives. Um, this one's a fun one. So, uh, we've all seen data catalog cards. <coughs> That's how you find information. And it's the classic example when we talk about my favorite topic, metadata. Um, oh, these usually come in point by point. Um, but metadata to me is, is like art. Right? Mm -hmm. Metadata is like art. It's very subjective. Um, you kind of know it, like when you see it, you're like, oh, that's it. That's art. Like, this is art. I don't know. Do you guys have, does anybody recognize this? Mm -hmm. yeah? It's a great painting. I love it. It's my, one of my favorite pieces of art. Not everybody agrees with me. Some people think <laughs> it's lines and squares. Um, <laughs> It's very subjective, especially when you talk to a lot of people, and, and very few people listen to professionals. Um, often you'll, you'll talk about, and, and we'll cover this later, but often you'll see topics that are covered online where metadata is like, the government has my telephone calls, or Facebook stores who I you know, spoke to. These are, these are not metadata. Um, these are people who you shouldn't be listening to. People like Steve yeah, is a good person to listen to when it comes to this topic. Um, but ultimately, when we talk about metadata, and I want to cover this in, in a lot of depth because as library provision people, when we start talking about them, this is where we start getting very technical. Um, when we start talking about ways to manage information, metadata is one of the key things that people will talk to you about, and it's one of the first places where your eyes kind of glaze over. 
Um, so when it comes to a data store, like any, any piece of data, there's a book, there's a, a table, an Excel spreadsheet, you know, an infinitely backed up Amazon, Magic Cloud, anything. Um, we have two types of metadata that we talk about. Um, and this is, this is the, the kind of two that I, I focus on. Um, this is the split that I like, but a lot of people disagree with me on this one. But um, we have descriptive metadata. This is stuff about the box. Um, who wrote it? What's its name? Where does it cover? When was it collected? All of this information is relevant to this big old can of data. Like I can look at this and say, this information is about this can. I can say, this piece of data has a name, this piece of data was collected at a particular point in time, all of the necessary information. Now we'll have what's commonly termed structural metadata. Um, on the flip side, this is stuff that has broad reusability. This is how is the physical object stored. How, you know, how did I store a particular column of information? What particular columns exist in there? So that I can say, across a hundred pieces of data, what overlaps are there? You know, where, where has similar information been collected before? Whereas in the former, I can know about one piece of data. With the latter, I can start exploring across multiple, multiple broad pieces of data, across you know, infinite domains. Um, as an example, and this is, uh, I took this from a slide, uh, there was a disaster yesterday. Keep backups, by the way. <laughs> there was a disaster yesterday with my slides. Um, so I've, I've stolen this from when I go to the National Archives. And this is looking at, at a National Archive record from online. Um, here we can see uh, a, series of, uh, a series of information based on a physical collection that's stored within the National Archives about the Australian infantry, infantry? Imperial Forces. Um, on the left, we have structural metadata. The existence of all of these keys to say whenever the National Archives collect something, we will always have a series number, we will always have a title. That description is, is structural. It says all of these records have the same structure um, for, you know, for all of these series. On the right, however, we have the descriptive metadata. All of this on the right is applicable to series B2, Four, five, up. It will never be applicable to B two, four, five, six. That's just ridiculous. It's crazy to us. Um, there might be some overlaps, like maybe B two, four, five, six was collected at the same point in time, but it's not the same date. <coughs> so knowing that that uh, that difference, when you start talking to people about, I have metadata. It's like, well, what kind? Both are infinitely valuable. When I have descriptive metadata, I know what I've got in my collection. When I have structural metadata, I know how I can store it and compare it. Both are important, and being able to separate that when you're having a discussion with somebody who's delivering you data is quite valuable. Um, so yeah, ultimately, this is the kind of differences we're looking at. One is about the data, one is about you know, a particular instance of data. It's the difference between, uh, is it information about the data, or is it a contractual way of saying, this is how it's stored. Like, Structural information can be very contractual in the sense where you say, it must be like this. If it's not like this, there's an obvious invalid problem. Um, and again, likewise, they, they help with that dichotomy of search and retrieval, or storage and retrieval. Um, structural information tells you how it's stored, and then descriptive information tells you how you can find it again. Um, lastly, uh, this is a, a new topic that, that often comes up, especially now that we're talking about data as it comes from an original source to a final area. Um, data does not spring from nothing. Uh, data collection happens from individuals, from sensors in the field. It happens you know, down at a coffee shop. Um, we're collecting data all the time. Over time, we start aggregating this up. Like, I want to go, what's the total number of, of coffees that were sold today at the bookshop cafe? Well, I have to add it up. If I add it wrong, there's a problem. And I've gone from one piece of data to another piece of data. When I start going, how much coffee was sold in all of Canberra? I add up you know, this cafe and a hundred other cafes. I add it up wrong. I've got another piece of data. Right? None of these particular pieces of information are wrong, but they're all separate. Data provenance is about describing that chain of how the sausage was made. <laughs> this is gross. <laughs> gross. Just disgusting. Um, no, but effectively, when people talk about data provenance, and, and it's a big word that people love to throw around because it does kind of have a lot of weight. But what it means is, how did it get here? Like, where did it come from? What is the chain of evidence from an original collection to the thing that I've got today? Um, so, again, a necessary topic for us to cover because it is. 
um, one that comes up a lot. Uh, and lastly, if, if you kind of get lost during all this stuff, um, we've put together <coughs> as part of our education program, um, at the CSIRO with our startup, uh, basically a series of topics, it's kind of hard to see, but basically what we're trying to do is describe in very, very low level terms to end users who are providing data, what we talk about when we say <coughs> data management, metadata standards. These are key things that are necessary nowadays because every field, every research area, every community, every government agency is collecting data. Um, you know, Rugby Western Australia just got shut down because of data issues where they lost you know, a couple of thousand dollars or a couple of hundred thousand dollars of money. You know? um, everybody's collecting data, everybody's looking into it. So being able to share terms, being able to have a common vocabulary when we're talking about these things is utterly necessary. So you have people coming to you who are lost, or if you're one of the brave few who can say, you lost me there, um, if you search for these videos, 5 Minute Metadata, we have, we're starting to build up a, a nice framework of breaking these things down so that they aren't scary terms. So, with that in mind, we come to the topic of standards. Um, I'm not a huge fan of XKCD, but this is probably one of the most applicable ones. <laughs> Uh, and it's really, really accurate. Um, I'm, I'm going to say I'm guilty. I've actually invented my own standard. I did it. It was a bad idea. Um, I thought it was a great idea at the time. Um, but yeah, there are so many data standards. Jade asked me, she says, can you talk about data standards? And I'm like, for 20 minutes? Like, for which field? For which topic? Like, there are data standards for physics. There are data standards for chemistry. There's, um, my favorite one, Dublin Core has, We've all heard of Dublin Core? Yeah. Have, have, has anybody heard of Darwin Core? Yeah. Oh, cool. Oh, that's good. <laughs> no. Okay, who, who hasn't heard of Darwin Core? Okay, cool. Darwin Core is Dublin Core with like two extra fields added for biodiversity sciences. Like there's a biodiversity standard for data storage. Like, who would have thought, right? This is what I'm saying. Like there are so many standards out there. Um, being able to, to delve into these topics is really, really important. So um, if we've all heard of like Dublin Core, we can kind of very quickly, oh, who had Okay. Dublin Core is basically this. Um, Dublin Core is the, the, the most basic of information standards. If you have a resource, please give me these 15 items. If you give me these 15 items, then I will say, you'll have a pretty good idea of what's in there. Okay, it's pretty accurate, right? Um, HELS is the Australian Government Locator Service, which is the Australian branded version of Dublin Core, effectively, for government resources that the National Archives put out. <coughs> uh, but again, effectively the same kind of stuff. Like, who is it? Like, where did it come from? Am I allowed to use it? When did you collect it? All of these basic ideas. Um, moving in a little bit deeper, I want to talk about ANSLIC. Um, <coughs> yeah, I know, it's scary. Um, no, it's scary. And, and I'll talk about why I put this together in a second. Um, ANSLIC is a, a geospatial profile for describing government data sets or academic data sets, any data set really. Any data set? Steve's kind of like, oh, like this. Any data set. I don't use it, but... Uh... A lot of people do. Yeah. Geoscience Australia, love yeah. ANSLIC. Um, thousands and thousands of data sets out there exist with an ANSLIC metadata profile. Um, and this is the information model, and I can tell you, it looks like this. If you have some data, and it's about a place on a map, ANSLIC is a, like a 50 page document that essentially says if you've got that data, can you draw a square around it on a map? Can you tell me when it was collected? And can you tell me who collected it? Right? Much, much easier than that. Right? What it means, just draw a square, right? that kind of stuff. Um, but again, very, very high profile in the Australian community. Uh, a lot of geoscience or geospatial agencies and academic areas love ANSLIC because, again, it's a very basic profile for describing geospatial data. Who here's hit data.gov.au, got on there? Oh, the rest of you are missing out. Um, it's a very, very valuable resource uh, that's starting to act as a federation point for all <coughs> state and federal data to be accessible through a single point. Um, it's starting to allow us to really explore and understand the data that's out there in the government space. And there's one really valuable thing that, that um, data.gov does that, that most other government platforms don't do. It's built on a standard. Um, CCAN is a, I can't remember what C stands for, but it's a knowledge archive network that has produced a data management platform that's pretty good. Like all standards, I can only really say it's pretty good, but 
the advantage is by knowing data.gov.au, you all of a sudden know data.gov.uk, data.gov, no.us, they're just like .gov. Data.gov, data.gov.sa.au, data.wa, like there's like 50 of them in the US, there's like 20 in, in the UK, like there's starting to be like a, a massive network of data. Um, when, you, when you start to, to use data.gov.au, you start to see the hints. Like when you see this panel, like th these four numbers of discoverable data sets, API resources, open license data sets, unpublished data sets, 90% of people who implement a CCAN based platform don't change that. So as soon as you see this, you know it's a CCAN based thing. You instantly understand it every time you go to a fresh one. So when you start you know, acting as this role as a data librarian to help people uncover more information, you get to be an expert in this area because you're like, I know this one. It's like, how did you know that? It's like, magic. <laughs> um, secondly, national back. Um, national I'm sorry. You can I like these things. So. That's a pretty good one. <laughs> National Map, I nearly lost my cool when I first saw about this. Um, so, who here has heard of the Australian Geographic Standards? Oh, cool. Um, the Australian Geographic Standards are published by the ABS uh, every couple of years, and they say these are the standard geographies for Australia. Um, they go from about as big as a street block all the way up to a state, <coughs> and most. Most government data is aggregated at these levels. So you start to, to be able to compare information from across sources. What National Map has done is made it in, like, immensely easier for organisations to start visualising this and comparing this. If you have data that has, like, you'll, you'll start noticing SA codes. So write that down. <coughs> write that down. <laughs> what does SA stand for? Statistical area. So an SA code um, is basically a way that the ABS has coded a geography and said, this point here, I really wish I could tell you what the ACT one is off the top of my head, but um, this point here, you know, means this, so if I have two pieces of data with the same essay code, I'm talking about the same area. This has been really, 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 really relevant in the last week, because when they published the marriage results surveys, they were able to compare the 2016 census, which had the Commonwealth Electoral Divisions against it, with the data from the survey itself, which has led to massive insights. Standards are great. Standards are great. Um, and likewise, because all of these geogra geographic boundaries are stored in national map, people can start dragging their own data in and saying, well, I went out and I collected it as well. Drag it in as a CSV, and all of a sudden, you can produce maps and tools and all sorts of valuable information necessary to kind of show users why these standards are good. Um, this is mine. I have to chuck in my marketing slide. Um, as the developer of, of Aristotle Metadata, we're currently working with a number of government agencies to help them describe the structural information they're collecting better. Um, we're still quite early and we only have a few implementations, but we're going to get big. Um, but yeah, that one's out there. Um, and lastly, data.world is pretty neat. Um, I'd strongly recommend everybody like start checking it out if you're interested in data. Um, I kid you not, that's, that's not the name. <coughs> that's the URL. <laughs> data.world. Um, Data.world is trying to market themselves as the social network for data sciences online. It's got a very slick user interface, they know what they're doing, and it's starting to allow people to upload their data and start collecting it from multiple sources. So if I upload something and then you upload something, I can say, I want this one and I want this one. And they have online notebooks so you can start processing it online. Um, very, very valuable, really, really cool stuff coming out of there. Um, and lastly, um, the most important one, um, again, XKCD, have a quick look. Um, digital resources go, like, get expired like that. Um, there was one that I saw on my phone recently. Somebody's internet connected light company has shut down. So their internet connected light has <laughs> shut down. Like, because the service provider is gone, they can no longer turn on their light. <laughs> this is the world we live in, and we can't get away from that. Um, be aware that all data sources have inherent risk, much, much more risk than a book. Like a book, you can see it, you can touch it, you can feel it, you can smell it and go, it's getting a bit mouldy, let's get a new copy. Like with data, one day, power outage at the wrong time and dang, aren't you glad you had your back? <laughs> so, how do you evaluate data resources or metadata resources? Um, there's no hard and fast rules for this, but these are the, the, probably the top four tips that I can give you when it comes to evaluating any data resource online. 
Um, effectively, you're going, to be, you're going to be talking about the communities around these things, but the number one thing is currency. When was the last time that this standard was updated or reviewed? Like, ISO 11179, my one, it was made in the 70s, but every <coughs> couple of years they go, yep, still good, yep, still pretty good. Um, when did they last do that? Like, was it 10 years ago? Has, it, has, it, has anybody looked at it in 10 years? That's, that's an inherent risk. It doesn't mean it's bad, just be aware of it. Frequency. When is it updated? How frequently do people review this standard? Like, they published it, um, are they reviewing it every couple of weeks, every month, every year? Like, how is it being reviewed? Specificity. Um, this is an interesting one. So, on the one end, you've got Dublin Core. Absolutely any resource can be recorded by Dublin Core. Anywhere, at any time. Like, if you have a title, you can store it as Dublin Core. On the far end, you've got, like, Deep, deep natural sciences um, standards that are only applicable for MRI machines. A one MRI machine in particular, one brand of MRI machine, but it's still being used, right? Specificity, like, I can't say only choose generic or only choose very, very specific, but knowing how that data can be used and who can understand it is really, really important. And that leads to the last one. Um, who is it targeted at? Uh, are we talking about, you know, a broad community of professionals? Or are we talking about anybody can understand this in 15 minutes? Um, I think like anybody who sat through a uh, half a lecture on Dublin Core kind of gets it, right? Mm. It's like, just put the name down, right? Um, whereas with some of these standards, there are you know, very esoteric jargon around them that are particular to a use case. Again, when you start evaluating these resources to know how to manage it, knowing how, how deep into the field you're going to have to go is really, really important. Um, does any one of these, like, you know, kind of rule out any particular standard? No. Um, but there are evaluation frameworks for us to know, is this going to be good, and is it going to be good in five years' time, or is it going to be good in ten years' time? Because I will tell you, the one big difference that I've found between the software community and the library community is around longevity and, and forward planning. Um, software development officially started about three weeks ago. Everything before three weeks was garbage. <laughs> and if my system's still running in, in a month, I'll be happy. Um, and that's the, the kind of attitudes that are prevalent in the data community, in the, soft, like in the software engineering communities. I, I say that with all the harshness that I can give to my professional community, is we have such short-sightedness. Um, your job as information professionals, and your job on the other side of, of the table from me, is to say, <coughs> how do you guarantee this a week from now, 10 weeks from now, 10 years from now, like 100 years from now? There are books in here 100 years old. There are, there are pieces of information that are like that was stored. Like there are there are arcade games that are no longer accessible. Like you just can't play it anymore. It's gone. It might as well have never existed. Maybe there's a YouTube video that shows it. We, as an information community, need to make sure that doesn't happen to vital data, not just arcade games. Um, so yeah. So thank you very much for listening to some software guy for 30 minutes ramble about data on a Saturday morning. It's quite rainy.